All right, let's get started then. Sorry that we're starting a little late. I'll try not to type too long. <laughs> no, it's okay, it's okay. You're just so good, it was worth it. <laughs> um, so I'm Kate with Nancy. I own Nurture and Nature Therapy Services, and I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I don't know how to go to the next slide, so let me figure that out. Okay, we do not have time. There we go. Okay, I have to actually press it. Um, one thing that might work is testing the arrow. Button. That's what I was doing before. Maybe it'll work now. Maybe it's kind of a weird one. Um, so I'll skip the full bio and resume and everything. I've got that on my website if you want to see all that. But I do want to mention that I am also a neurodivergent parent of neurodivergent kids. And that's part of where all of this comes from. Some of it's from my work, some of it's from my personal experience. A lot of it is from both because the same kinds of things tend to work at home and I think with my kids at work. All right, nature itself is the best physician. This is a well-known quote, I feel like, and I wanted specifically to bring up this quote to show these are, some of what I'm talking about today is not new ideas. This is, these are very old ideas. So that will sound very familiar. So, all right, I wanna start with just an overview of sensory processing, which is specifically how does our brain receive information? So through our sensory receptors, right? And there's these five basic ones that we learn about, about somewhere around the time of kindergarten that our, our eyes, our nose, our mouths, our ears, our hands, so that we have sight and smell and taste and hearing and touch. Um, and we know from Emily's presentation that these are not the only senses. There are actually three additional ones. The first one that I'll talk about is vestibular. This comes in through our semicircular canals in our ears. And that is our sense of specifically the movement of our head that helps us keep our balance. So we're using this sense when we fall or when we don't, um, when we are moving, or even we're just when we're just making small changes to our position to maintain an upright posture. So all of that we're using this particular. Proprioception is the next one that comes in through mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors in our joints and muscles, but also in our skin. So when we talk about deep pressure, that's actually not really a form of touch. It's a form of proprioception. And that's why it tends to be so regulated because when we are looking for regulating activity, this is the first place that we go. If you've heard of heavy work, that's referring to this sensory domain. Climbing, jumping, um, hanging, pulling, pushing, lifting, carrying, all of those things are heavy work and they're giving us proprioceptive input which tends to bring us to the middle. If we're feeling low energy, it's gonna to tend to bring us up. If we're feeling high energy, it's gonna to tend to bring us down. And that's what's so handy about this specific uh, sensory domain and heavy work in general and why you hear it recommended so much. And of course, interoception, which comes with from our internal organ receptors. So if our tummy is feeling tight and empty, then we know that that means we're hungry, that we need to eat something to take some action to help us feel more comfortable. We maybe don't eat grasshoppers, so no, the children were harmed in the Nikki, but. <laughs> 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 um, but it's really, it's a, that's when we have to tune into our body because that's the one signal that's coming from, or that's one of the signals that's coming from inside our body instead of outside our body. So if these are the sensory domains, those five, plus vestibular, proprioceptive, and interoceptive, what are we talking about when we talk about sensory processing disorder or sensory processing differences? Um, like Emily mentioned with some of these terms, they're, they're thrown around a lot. We hear a lot about sensory processing, but I'm going to talk specifically when there's differences, what those look like, what they fall under. So there's three primary areas. The first one is sensory modulation, which is what is it that we're feeling? If there's dysfunction with sensory modulation, it might show up as over-responsivity, which is where we notice things more and we tend to react bigger. With under-responsivity, it actually takes more to get us to notice. We need more intense or more longer lasting to be able to notice it. And with sensory craving, I love the term craving instead of seeking because mm -hmm. sensory craving truly feels like that. It, it, it's seeking it out, but in an almost obsessive way. Like, I, I need it, I need it. And when I get it, I'm not necessarily regulated by it. <laughs> a lot of times it leads to more dysregulation because the need for it is so big. So these are the kids that you see them seeking out movement, but they become more and more crazy and wild the more that they move around. So that's our sensory craving. Sure. Oh. 
Um, I wanted to mention with each of these that they can happen differently for each of the different sensory domains. So just because somebody is over responsive to auditory input doesn't mean that they're also going to be over responsive to touch and smell and taste. It, it can be a mix. It can be over responsive to some, under responsive to others, craving for others. And there can even be this difference within the same sensory domain that they might be over responsive to some forms of touch and also craving certain forms of touch. We actually see this difference a lot between active and imposed input. If a kiddo is seeking out input themselves, they're going to tend to be able to handle that better. If it's in, if it's something that's happening to them, that's going to be harder to process. These are actually our kids that make a lot of noise but can't handle noise. Have you, have you seen that before? Mm -hmm. Seen kids like that? Yeah, they can't handle noise from other people. Other people can't be seen, but they're constantly making noise. That's what that is. It's the active versus the imposed. Um, there we go. Sensory discrimination is the second area. And this is how accurate is what we're feeling. Can I feel the difference between the smooth, round, hard gooseberries and soft, bumpy raspberries in my hand without looking. This is actually referred to as stereognosis. It's what we use when we reach into our purse to find something without having to actually dig through and look to find it. We use our sense, our, our sense of touch to feel what we're feeling, to find what we need. We use discrimination also in the proprioceptive sense to grade how much force we're using. So when I'm playing tug of war, can I make sure that I'm not pulling so hard that I pull my friend's limbs off in this middle picture, right? We want to make sure not to pull so hard that we'll hurt him. Um, with visual discrimination too, can I see maybe part of the tail of a crayfish peeking out from under a rock and make meaning out of that? That if I pick up the rock, I'll find the rest of the crayfish because that's really going to motivate me to move and participate and engage with my environment. But if that discrimination piece is missing, I might not be so so motivated <coughs> to and interact with my environment because I'm not able to make sense and meaning of what's coming in. And the third area is sensory-based motor disorders, and this is where we talk about dyspraxia and postural disorder. Those are the two primary types that we see. Um, dyspraxia tends to show up. The questions on like the sensory profile tend to ask about how the child does when they carry multiple things. So if they have to carry more than two things, do they kind of automatically <coughs> touch something under their arm or feel something over their shoulder so that they have their hands free to carry more things? Or is it a lot of fumbling or maybe just not being able to carry more than two things at once? Or maybe they're getting super dysregulated because it's taking so much energy to try to figure it out. So if those movements don't come automatically, that's what we call dyspraxia. Um, I, when I worked in clinics, I saw this a lot with kids getting onto a swing. If you think of just a regular playground swing, kids with dyspraxia will tend to try to climb onto it instead of just turning around and sitting down because that, that movement doesn't come naturally. Their brains aren't sequencing the steps that they need to take and making it happen in a smooth manner. And so you might also see this with building things. Can you use sand and sticks to build a bridge? Can you use Legos to build a car? Um, all of that with part of that motor planning piece. And with the postural disorder, that's very much associated with differences in the proprioceptive, our muscles, um, and vestibular, the, our movement. Um, if we're not getting the right cues from our brain about those things, we might not have normal muscle tone, and it might, not, it might take a lot more energy to keep our, our posture upright and to stay stable enough that we can actually use our hands. So what you'll see a lot with these kids is they might have a wide base of support. You see that big W sit because they need a wide base in order to free up their hands. In chairs like this, I actually see kids wrap their legs around it to get that stability. Same kind of thing. They're trying to make it stable enough so that they can use their hands and pay attention. So why does all of this matter? We've talked about all the sensory receptors. We've talked about the different forms of sensory processing differences. Why does it matter? The song that popped into my head when I was making this slide was the same one that they bring up in CPR class. Stay alive, stay alive. This is literally how our brains taking information from inside and outside our bodies to make sense of it so that we can respond adaptively and continue to live, right? To do the things that we need to do to be able to interact with our environment. 
the difference between adaptive responses, which is the goal of sensory processing, that's the whole reason it exists, is to get those adaptive responses, versus not is this beautiful family picture versus maladaptive, this <laughs> kiddo about to bang his sister's head with the pipe. That did not happen. I did intervene in time, just so you know. <laughs> but I thought this was a perfect example of adaptive versus maladaptive responses. So what happens when we have sensory processing differences, when we have maladaptive responses? What happens is the kiddo in the top left corner of this picture, kids get left out, intentionally or unintentionally, because of their own withdrawal or their own meltdowns or because of the responses of other people to their behavior. They don't feel comfortable in their own skin, so they don't feel comfortable joining in. And this is a lot where we see those social skill difficulties coming in. And as parents, we see our kids' strengths, and we want to help the world see them as well. We want to help them function and succeed. Um, but we're at a loss. How? How? It doesn't matter how much we teach them. It doesn't matter how much we show them. It doesn't matter how much we educate other people. They're still not fitting in. They're still not able to participate in these typical childhood activities. And there's this idea, especially now with the neurodiversity movement, to just be yourself. The world will adjust. Oh my, how I wish that were true. <laughs> Maybe in some small ways it's becoming truer. Overall, the truth is that this world was not built for our kids. These buildings, these um, the furniture, not built for our kids to give them the types of input that they need. We actually sense this with littles. When a baby is crying, not calming down, not soothing, it's common for us to take them outside. Even if they're a newborn and have very little awareness of what's around them, they're going to sense that difference enough to be able to be seen. So they're going to sense that difference enough to feel, feel different and move on to a different emotional state. And I've seen this even more dramatically in my work. Um, I spent the first oh, seven, eight years of my career working in pediatric therapy clinics. So we were indoors. And it was a big part of my job to create a perfect environment that offered challenge and comfort in the right mix to get those adaptive responses, to teach the child what calm feels like, to teach them how they can handle this sensory input and still interact. Um, but pulling my work outdoors has been incredible to see what a huge part that nature plays because that perfect mix of comfort and challenge is already there. I don't have to create. I don't have to go ahead of time and set up the environment. There's such variety around us. Kids will seek out the right kinds of challenges and especially in group situations, bond together to, to approach them. And I feel like nature is actually my co-therapist. It's actually like I have help. <laughs> I'm gonna use for you there. Very cool to see. So I wanna actually do a little experiment with this and think about how, what, like what do we see here? We see a classroom, kind of a typical classroom. And I wanna go through and think about how do our kids on the spectrum experience this? And we're gonna go through each of the senses. So visually, what do you think that, what do you think they're seeing? Too much. Too much, yeah. what, what is too much? It's just overwhelming. Too many things, too many colors. Yeah. Too many things. Too many things. <coughs> really bright lights, yeah. I also noticed that the light is really consistent across the classroom. There's not anywhere that I can go that's a little bit darker or more shaded. I mean, I guess I could go under the table, but I would get in trouble for that. Mm -hmm. So it's really consistent across. My eyes are drawn out towards the windows because I can't take in all that different colors and contrast. So I just to go to the black and white windows. Um, a, where it's more simple, more peaceful, less chaotic. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. How about auditory? What are they hearing? Imagine a typical classroom filled with kids. What are you hearing? Uh, noise. A lot of noise. Yeah, you might even hear noise from the hallways, from your classrooms. There's also noise that happens anytime you're indoors. The hum of the AC, mm -hmm. of the heat, of any kind of electronic that's on makes the, makes the sound. Lots of it, lots of input coming in, and it tends to follow you no matter where you go. Even if I go out into the hallway, still going to hear voices, still going to hear the hum of the AC. How about touch? What kind of textures are we seeing in this? Cold. 
cold, cold yes yeah, that's what i thought too cold and hard yeah but a lot of smooth surfaces the carpet offers a little bit more texture but it's uniform all the way across so if i feel the carpet over here it's going to feel the same as if i feel it over here mm -hmm. lots of smooth and hard this is where i almost left out because there's no food in this picture and then i thought no that's exactly part of the point there's nothing in this picture that we can eat Maybe wow. for a math lesson, we might be counting M&Ms, we might be using those as math things to do this. I remember making necklaces out of fruit loops in school when I was a kid, so we might bring in food, um, but for the most part, we are not stimulating the gustatory sense. I eat paper. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I eat paper. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> because of how it feels chewing it or because of the taste of it on the tongue? Well, I, I like chewing it and i like the texture change yeah so this is a really good point actually with chewing we tend to think of that as a taste thing a lot of times it's not it's actually the the physical act of chewing is activating the muscles and joints of the jaw and that's what's regulating so you have to really look at when kids are putting things in their mouths is it that they need more taste input or is it that they need more proprioceptive input all right let's look, look at olfactory what are you smelling when you're in a classroom, what kinds of things might you smell? Chemicals. Chemicals. That was the first thing that I thought of, the cleaners, the disinfectants. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. This is how I can tell we don't have any nine-year-old boys in the audience. No one is saying you would smell farts. I was thinking smelling other people's stinky feet. Yeah. Other kids have stinky feet. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You might smell the teacher's coffee. The smells are going to tend to stick around a while because we're indoors. There's no breeze to blow them away. All right, how about vestibular? What are the different ways we can move in the classroom? Climbing on tables. Climbing on tables, but we're going to get in trouble for that. What else? Oh, yeah, that's a great point, which not only can get them in trouble, and it's, it's a safety issue. Yeah. But you're, that's a perfect example. I tilt my chair all the time. My mom yes. does not like it. <laughs> Which is totally normal, right? You need that, you need movement. You need that sense stimulated. How about proprioception? Are there ways that we can climb, hang, pull, push, lift, carry? Maybe it, if we're moving the tables around, that's the only thing I can really it, do. In our, in the, the church building that I go to, there are tiles uh, on the ceiling. It, that are just like loose they're just in their frames okay. not nailed down so you're able to push them up and move them which is fun <laughs> you're not supposed to do <laughs> that's the thing is that most forms of movement and proprioceptive input in a classroom you just get in trouble for so this is I, I like teaching kids things like pushing their hands together or doing a chair push-up by pushing on their chair because that's a way that they can get a bit of proprioceptive input without getting in trouble I also like that there's somewhat of a push now to bring yoga into classrooms, to bring like go noodle videos, something that gives us some movement and some proprioceptive input. That's great. That's great. We're helping to stimulate the senses. And how about interoception? What I, I think the thing that I think they're first here is that even if I sense the need in my body, it's likely that I would be expected to wait until the end of the lesson or at least raise my hand and ask permission to be able to use the restroom, take a drink of water, or go get a drink of water, move my body, um, I would have to ask permission first. And I will also tell you from my personal experience with sensory processing differences, that if you have over-responsivity in any of these other domains, you're not gonna tend to be tuning into your body <laughs> because you're gonna be so busy feeling the input that's coming from the environment, you're not even gonna be paying attention to what's going on in your body. There's not gonna be an opportunity to do that. Next picture. I can't help that this picture just makes me go, oh, I thought I was showing my bias here, but oh my gosh, what do we see? A hiking trail, a prairie, a forest, a sky with clouds. Forests are very nice. There's so much variety in nature. Yes, exactly. So visually, what do we see? Openness. Openness. Openness, yeah. We can look really far. We can look really close, or we can look really far, or we can look anywhere in between. And three Shade. things in the focus. Shade. Shade, yes. I love the variety of light here. There's places that we can be in the sun, we can be in the shade. We can also direct our eye gaze to be looking at things in the sun or be looking at things in 
in shade. If we feel overwhelmed looking at things in the sun, we can shift our gaze to look at things in shade. Yeah. How about auditory? What kinds of things do you think you would be hearing out there? Mm -hmm. That's an important one because that won't be constant. It'll be intermittent. And it might be stronger sometimes, weaker other times, not present other times. The crunch of your own footfalls. Yeah, really, but especially in this season in fall. That's one of my favorite things about fall is when you're hiking. Crunch, crunch, crunch. Bugs and flies and bees. You might hear buzzing. Yep. I always say that a lot of kids get worried by, by bugs flying around them. And I would say they're just looking for food. They're looking for food. They might fly around you. They might even land on you, but they're going to figure out that you're not a flower. <laughs> you are not what they're looking for. Yeah. And how about tactile? What kind of textures do we have? Mm -hmm. This is my favorite thing about being outdoors. Huge variety, huge variety of textures. I can think of the mullein plant that's super soft and squishy. I can think of golden rods that have those galls on them that are so satisfying. <laughs> They're birds. Yeah, yeah. And then also the things that are out here, we don't have to touch or manipulate them in a certain way. When you have, when you're in a classroom and you get a marker out, you take the cap off and you color with it. You do anything else with it, you toss it in the air, you spin it around, it's going to be distracting. You're probably going to get in trouble for it. But here, like even with something like an acorn or a seed pod, I can rub it, I can toss it up in the air, I can spin it around, I can open it, I can, with acorns, I like hitting a bunch and taking the caps off of them and then shaking them and they sound like dice. So that gives us some auditory input too. There's so many different ways to interact with the ones. You could put it in your mouth. You could put it in your mouth. <laughs> now I'll warn you that I recently found out that there are tiny little white shrubs in some yep. acorns. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so I would say don't put it in your mouth. <laughs> All right, how about gustatory? What are we smelling? You know, like pine trees. Nice small pine trees. Yeah, yeah. Not a lot though, right? We wouldn't be smelling a lot. This is the beauty of being outdoors is there's so much air that even if a smell comes through, it's not gonna tend to stay for very long. The breeze will come through and blow it away. The, the air, it will get mixed in with the rest of the air. So it's much, the, the smells tend to be less overwhelming outdoors, unless I am seeking more smell and then I can go closer to something to smell it. But as soon as I come away, then I get that, that down range. Just yeah. fresh air. Fresh air, fresh yeah, air. beautiful. <laughs> All right. Oh, wait, we didn't, we didn't touch. Oh, sorry, I mixed these two up. Um, for taste, are there things out here that we could taste? Yes, over. Yes, definitely. Now, I always say I, I have a lot of safety rules around foraging. There are some dangerous things out there. So with kids, I tell them never eat something without checking with your adult first. And for the adults, I'd say don't approve eating something unless you are 100% sure what it is. You're looking not just at the fruit, you're looking at the leaves, the shape of the plant, the location of the plant, um, all that kind of thing to tell you what it is. But yeah, there's a lot we can taste out here. Gooseberries, raspberries, mulberries, even dandelion, lamb's quarter, wood sorrel. In the spring, violets are edible. There's so many. Grass. Grass. <laughs> Maybe yeah, not grass. so good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you can just chew on the grass. All right, how about this smoother? How can we move our bodies out here? Any way you want. Because there is not only the allowance to do that, there's the space to do it without bumping into furniture or other people. You can run, you can jump, you can spin. You can go ahead on the trail, you can hang back on the trail, you can have your space. And how about proprioception? Are there opportunities for proprioception? Some we already talked about. Jumping would give you some proprioception. Also, there's a lot of trees. Climbing trees gives us a chance to climb. We can also hang from a tree. We can hide in the tall grass. Yeah, yeah. We can move um, fallen branches to make a shelter. We can move big rocks to make a bridge. We can do all sorts of things outdoors. That's heavy work. And with interoception, a lot, most people find it easier to tune into their bodies when they're outdoors. There's natural pause that comes and a natural rhythm to what's happening around you that helps you feel safe enough to tune in. And then if you have a need, it's typically easier to take care of.
So why is outside better for our kids? There are some theories around this and some really exciting research. This is, I looked into all this when I first started nurturing nature and it was just blew my mind. So the first theory that I'll talk about is biophilia hypothesis. And this is talking about humans innate tendency to be drawn toward other living things, that we seek them out, they draw our interest. So plants, trees, animals, insects, even if it ends up causing fear, it still draws our attention and affects our emotions in a way that make, maybe a box of markers or a tablecloth does. It, it makes us feel. There's also attention restoration theory. If you have a kiddo with ADHD or attention differences, it, this is a nice one to dive into because there's so many aspects to it. But I'm just going to pull out the difference between directed attention and soft fascination. So directed attention is when we purposely point our attention at something. You guys are doing it right now to pay attention to this presentation. I'm doing it right now to be able to give this presentation. If I'm reading a book, if I'm writing something, most, the vast majority of things that we do during the day use our directed attention. And the idea is that this is kind of like a muscle and it gets tight. And that's why after dinner, we put the kids to bed, we go to go write our notes or to do work or to do the dishes and we feel too tired, right? Like it's, our attention has been used. It has been, it, it, it is tired, it needs a break. The nice thing with soft fascination is that's when your attention is gently and naturally pulled into something and it actually gives that directed attention muscle a break. So they've done studies that show if you take kids for a walk outdoors in a, in a more nature environment versus taking them outdoors in a more urban environment, their attention and focus is better after the walk if they've been out in a nature environment. So this is something I think teachers can pull in during standardized testing or that kind of thing. If you take a walk, don't just do it indoors. Don't just do it even at the playground. If there's a grassy area or a foresty area, go there. You're going to get a lot more benefits from that. And for this last theory, it's got a lot of name, environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. But the way I want to picture it is to imagine your 1,000 direct ancestors standing in line. So 1,000 1, grandmas, okay? Your grandma, great grandma, great, great grandma, great, great, great grandma. Yeah, you did it, you did it. And I actually think, first of all, how long is that line? Like 1,000 is one of those numbers. It's got three zeros. It's hard to actually picture what it means. So here's a diagram of 1,000 dots. Okay, we've got 10 dots in each row. We've got 10 rows in each little square, 10 little squares in each row, and then 10 rows of little how many of these little squares do you think would have lived primarily in yours? So my sciencey friend said maybe a hundred, maybe two hundred. Even your grandma and your great grandma, did they spend as much time in yours as you do now? No. No. So what this theory is saying is the way that we that humans developed was in response to their environment, which was outdoors. The way our sensory systems developed was to notice and respond and block out what we don't need to know all outdoors. And maybe one day we will get to the point where our brains are adapted to our indoor environments more, but we are not there yet. <laughs> and we are not even close. <laughs> oh we are cavemen still essentially. Like, in our brains and, and what our brains are looking for and how they really function is still geared toward outdoors. And how do we miss this? Not just the importance of being outdoors, but the importance of sensory processing to autistic function. I think part of it is that it is not at the forefront of autistic diagnosis. So I think Holly this morning went through the, all of the diagnostic criteria for autism in her presentation, but the sensory processing piece is a sub point of criteria B and is not even required for diagnosis. Now, this is my opinion and my experience, but after 37 years of living as someone with significant sensory processing differences, over 20 years of working with neurodivergent families in various settings, and over 13 years of parenting kiddos with neurodevelopmental differences, I believe that sensory processing is at the core of autistic struggles. It's at the core of what we see. Okay, so what I want to say is 
I, I want to give a disclaimer that I'm not saying that by providing sensory accommodations and understanding sensory processing that we can make autism go away. We can cure it, right? That's not realistic. But we can certainly help our kids feel more comfortable on their own skin so they feel comfortable joining it. We can certainly more effectively help them do the things that they need and want to do. I see when Brandon was giving this talk this morning about the two different islands, I really see those two different islands as two flip sides of the coin. On one side, we have the struggles and we do need help with those. But on the other side of that same coin are the strengths. The, the best parts of our kids that we see come out. And we don't get to see that very often because we're struggling so much with, with the sensory processing. <clears throat> so I think this is a huge area for intervention that can make a big difference. But it makes sense to me that we focus our interventions on social skills, we focus our interventions on behavior, because those are the primary diagnostic criteria, right? So why does sensory matter so much? Again, it's literally how we're staying alive. How can I learn when my body's in a state of, am I safe or am I not, when I'm not feeling safe? How can I interact with people if I don't feel safe, right? It all comes from a sense of safety. Yeah. Do you feel that those behavior outcomes and social differences are influenced by I do. And this is partly my experience. I, I was diagnosed autistic, you know, level one at, I think of it as Asperger's as actually being more accurate, but my experience has been, yes, when the part, the points in my life when I struggle more with social is because I'm struggling more sensory. The points in my life where I'm seeking out more repetitive behavior is because I'm struggling with sensory and it provides so much soothing. So what can we do? This is the part where I can give some practical tips for getting outdoors and for addressing sensory processing differences. And the first one is probably doesn't come as a surprise. Just get outside. This is actually a hashtag nowadays. It kind of strikes me as like a bossy hashtag. I always feel like I'm being like, get outside. <laughs> so to kind of dial that down, you it doesn't matter where you go, right? You don't have to go get a state park pass. You don't have to make camping reservations and get all the camping gear. Step outside into your backyard. Um, pause along your way when you're walking to the mailbox. Bring out your child's favorite activities and items. Like this is my son sweeping the grass, right? Doesn't matter because that's what you love doing at the time. So bring those things out. And yes, for some kids that might mean bringing their screens outdoors. Like that is gonna, the, it, screens I meant to talk about with the soft fascination because um, screens pull our attention in, in a high stimulation way. Whereas nature things tend to pull our stimulation, our attention in, in a low stimulation way. So that's kind of the difference. So, but step one, just get outside. I've seen amazing pictures where um, a, a kid's mom tells them to stop, to like go outside because they're playing video games. So and they move outside. all their stuff outside and keep playing. Yep, yep. <laughs> <laughs> it's a step in the right direction. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that we can do is help them get comfortable. And part of this is helping them tune into that interceptive piece. But part of this is just practical gear. Like, take a soft blanket out. I love electric hand warmers in the winter because they stay consistently warm. Um, put them in waterproof clothing if they don't like their skin getting wet. That's not just in the winter, but in any time that it's wet outside or that we're going to be in a wetter environment. Um, they've got bug nets that can go over your head. We, I actually use these too at times of year where there's like clouds of gnats or clouds of mosquitoes. Like I don't want gnats in my nose and ears and mouth. So that can help to provide a layer. In the summer, I like providing garden gloves for kids that need a layer between them and what they're touching because then they're not too warm, but they're still getting that extra protection. Mm -hmm. And partner with nature. Really make it a part of what you're doing. You're not just taking a walk and talking about any old thing. We're noticing. What do you see? What do you hear? Go through all those senses. Share that with your child. Point things out to them. And in addition to that specific sharing it with them, model your enjoyment of the environment. Model your engagement with it. Let them see that. Let them see how you react to things. And this is one that is... The, it comes the hardest, I think, for a lot of adults. We're used to, especially as parents, we're in the expert role, especially if we're a teacher, people ask you questions, you come up with the right answer for them. But I would encourage you outdoors to be an amateur. Step back from that expert role, get on your child's side, explore together. 
So if they ask a question, don't, don't just insert your solution. Kind of take a step back and see if there's other ways that we can look at it or other ways that we can approach the solution together. See if there's wondering questions that you can ask. I wonder if we do this. I wonder if we do that. I wonder what happens to get them thinking for themselves as well so that their impulse won't be when they have a question to just ask an adult, ask an adult, but to go, huh, I wonder if there's a way that I could figure this out myself. I wonder if there's a way that I could explore this. All right, the FAQ part of the presentation. This phrase, I hear your concerns, comes from Ross Green, one of my heroes that Emily mentioned. He wrote The Explosive Child. He, runs, he started the Lives in the Balance website, and his approach is called Collaborative and Proactive Solutions. So in this approach, we have to hear each other's concerns in order to reach a solution that will actually work. And so the, I find that this, uh, this provides a really nice framework for problem solving. I use it in my personal life in addition to my work, um, partly because part of what kids and, and adults with autism struggle with is perspective taking. And this framework requires you to find out the other person's perspective before you move on to, to trying to come up with solutions. So I love that. So let's go through some common concerns with giving kids updates. My kid doesn't like going out, but I hear you. <laughs> I am an age based therapist and I struggle really with this with my kids too. I will say that in my experience, the kids that tend to be most passionate about their screen time also tend to be the most active adventurers outdoors. They can get pulled in completely by screens and they can get pulled in completely by building a bridge at the river or finding a wood bear caterpillar. So we, you can see both. Um, I'm actually going to go to my book on this because there was something that I wanted to mention. Oh, I wanted to mention the technology kind of weighs in to spending time outdoors. So we have geocaching, we have Pokemon Go, we have Google Earth. All of those are options to get a kiddo that's very focused on tech. That's what one of my kids calls them, tech. Um, to help get them outdoors. And what you would want to do is just start expanding their notice. When you're geocaching, you're in Pokemon Go, like, let's go check, catch, catch that, I don't know, what kind of are or something. I'm not Pokemon, that's one let's go check, catch that, and look, it's right over by the moon. Oh, that's such a soft one. Let's feel it and squish it. So just bring that attention to what's around what they're looking at, too. And that can be a great way to get started. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say too with that is expect that there will be bumps in the road with getting kids outdoors. Our kids struggle with transitions, even if it's to um, school or bed or the trampoline park. <laughs> like transitions are hard. So it, that's gonna be the same. There's no magic in this. Like sometimes it's gonna be hard. Don't don't give up. Like be flexible, be patient, but don't give up. Don't don't think that means that you're doing it wrong or anything like that. All right, this next one is a really important one. Some kids run, some kids are workers, and you have to keep them safe. How do you keep them safe when there's not four walls around them or there's not a fence? What I can offer, first of all, there are things like GPS trackers. I use Project Lightsaber for my own kid that wanders, um, so I can provide information on how to get started with that. Um, but in my two years of running these nature groups, I have had kids come in that parents have had a primary concern of, they run, how do you keep them safe? And it has never been an issue. The reason I think for that is when we are indoors, in order to get away from a specific sensory stimulus, we often have to leave the room. If you think about a place like this or, a, or a school, the hallway is gonna be about the same. <laughs> so I may have to leave the building to get relief from that sensory stimulus. It makes sense to me that we have to leave. When we're outdoors, it's a lot easier to step away. What I'll most likely have when a kiddo needs space is they go behind the nearest tree or maybe the next tree. And that gives them enough of a sense of being separate from the group and getting their space that they don't have to go farther. So follow, you know your kid best. Follow your instincts with this. Maybe you need to hold their hand while you're out there. Maybe you need to start in a place that has a sense around it. But just keep in mind that it's a whole different sense set of sensory input that we're doing outdoors, and that sensory overwhelm is likely contributing more than we think it is. Sometimes um, a 
parents will say, well, you know, it's not really sensory. It's like when my child gets upset, that's when they run. I'm like, yes, part of the reason they're getting upset is because they're right here. A demand is placed and it pushes them over the threshold into high arousal. What if we could bring that overall arousal down so that when the demand is placed, they're still within that window of tolerance, right? That it's, it's contributing more than you think because it's literally how we take in information from our environment and respond. Of course it's contributing. All right, and this one, we don't have time. Oh my goodness, how I feel this as a business owner and an OT and a mom of four. Uh, yeah, we don't. <laughs> so this is where I would say, pull it, pull it into what you're already doing. If you're driving, point out what you're seeing out of the window. If you're walking into therapy, squat down and notice an ant crawling over a rock. If you're walking your kid into the school building, look up at the clouds and notice what's happening in the sky. Those little awareness things those li will form a connection as well. And I also think this is where it's helpful to know about some studies about nature views that if with patients that are post-surgery, if they have a window that looks out onto a nature scene versus looks out onto a parking lot or another building, they have faster recovery, more smooth healing, fewer complications. And we can even replicate this with a picture of a foresty area or of a nature scene. So there, there is no step towards nature connection that's too small. Even just getting pictures of nature scenes, even just looking out the window at what we see. This is especially handy in January when it is minus 30. <laughs> we might be able to get outdoors but not for more than five minutes at a time safely. So this is where we can pull in that nature view and using pictures and books as well. And Oh, I am like twice on time. That is beautiful. Okay, so I suspected that I would talk too long to have actual questions. So I'm including my email address here. Feel free to reach out. I also have a story time a few Saturdays a month. The next one I think we're doing is not tomorrow, because I'll be here tomorrow. Um, but the next Saturday I think we're doing at MLK Park. Um, so you can always talk to me there too. I'm there with my kids, reading stories. You can talk before or after story time. Um, does anybody have any quick questions before we go on? For the next presentation. All right, you guys were awesome. Thanks for doing this with me.